Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Caitlin Hall, and I'm the Chief Storytelling Officer of the National Geographic Society. I'm honored to have the pleasure of hosting today's event, where we'll be seeing the incredible work of some of the world's best storytellers. While the focus of this event is on stories around COVID-19, I would like to begin by addressing another issue that may be on so many of our minds today. I have worked for the Society for 15 years, and I'm proud to be a part of an institution that believes everyone of every race, identity, experience, and ability should be able to safely explore the wonder of our world. We remain in support of human dignity, respect, and justice. Racism has no place in our world. Today and every day, we stand in solidarity with our community of Black explorers, educators, storytellers, and staff. We recognize that so many communities and journalists are under an incredible strain. And the events of the past two weeks have made us even more aware of the need for local journalism, local journalists and local stories. Quality journalism matters and we want to support journalists. That's why shortly after the declaration of the COVID-19 pandemic, the society took a moment to think about how we were uniquely positioned to contribute to what felt like an overwhelming international tragedy. As the largest funder of individual storytellers in the world, the society knew that this community had needs. We know them well. And we knew that storytellers from every country around the world were going to report, to cover, to document, to witness this moment. As one fund recipient wrote, quote, this is historical, I must record it. In order to support these storytellers' desire to report on the pandemic, while many were facing the financial repercussions of canceled assignments, we quickly launched the COVID-19 Emergency Fund for Journalists to safely cover the crisis in their own communities. In addition to covering the crisis, we wanted to support those wishing to tell the stories of local underserved and marginalized communities, those who are being disproportionately impacted by this disease. We also wanted to make sure that these journalists would look beyond traditional publishing methods to ensure that potentially life-saving information and resources was reaching these communities. We thought we'd have a small response from the journalist community, but we were overwhelmed with thousands of amazing applications from around the globe. As of today, we've received a total ask of 26 million US dollars in funding. We've funded 80 journalists so far from 42 countries, and we'll keep going. There are writers and filmmakers and photographers, and they're all dedicated to telling the COVID-19 story. Through their collective work, I feel that we may maybe begin to better understand, begin to process, and know how to act during this time. I'm thrilled that you get to hear from six of these fund recipients today. While their stories are still works in progress and represent just a tiny portion of the global body of work that's being built, the response to this fund has proven that the need for local reporting, both for and about our most at-risk communities, is only going to grow. Enjoy. First up, we head to Nairobi, Kenya, to Paula Kahumbu, CEO of Wildlife Direct and National Geographic Explorer. By the time the coronavirus reached Kenya, it was already the 21st of March, and the government decided to respond with very severe measures in order to flatten the curve. And what they did was they instituted a curfew from 7 p.m. until 5 a.m. in the morning, and they also locked down the city of Nairobi, where I live. We had predicted that the shutting down of business, the closure of the airport would lead to a collapse in tourism, which is important because it contributes 10% of the GDP and 25% of our foreign exchange. And that in turn would result in hundreds and thousands of jobs lost. That in turn would mean hungry people, but also less enforcement on the ground. So we predicted to see a rise in poaching. And what we saw was quite different. What we saw was the government use the cover of coronavirus to implement some very unpopular decisions that would affect the environment in irreparable ways. And that's what I chose to tell my story about. 
there were two big things that happened. First, the government decided to implement an extremely unpopular decision to build a expressway from the airport all the way into the city. And in doing so, destroy an avenue of trees which are now gone and also to take part of a national urban park. That case is currently in court. But the second thing that I decided to tell my story about was about the Nairobi National Park itself. Now this park is right in the city and it's amazing. It is full of animals, one of the highest biomass protected areas anywhere in the world with one of the largest amounts of biodiversity. We have rhinos, buffaloes, hippos, lions, hyenas, cheetah, you name it. It's an incredible protected area right in the city of Nairobi. And the reason why there is so much wildlife here is because although the area is bound in the north by the city, in the south it's open and the animals can move in and out of the park freely from a 117 square kilometer park into a 3000 kilometer dispersal area. And in that dispersal area, there are people who live there and they're primarily pastoralists. The plan that was so controversial was the 10 year management plan. Now this is a, a legal document that can be enforced by whatever is in that plan. Legally, these plans have to be discussed with stakeholders and there also has to be a process of public participation. But by doing it during the lockdown of coronavirus, the government could get away with slipping into these plans ideas that would otherwise be fiercely fought by the people. Those plans include the construction of hotels, restaurants, amphitheatre, museum, zip lines, all inside this tiny little national park that's already under a lot of threat. And so there's been a huge hullabaloo about it. And I went out with Enoch, a journalist with the largest national television station called Citizen. And we went down to the south of the national park to talk to the community who live there. We wanted to find out what did they know about this plan and what did they think about it? Now to get to the south of the park, you have to drive down the major highway and turn south at a town called Athi River. The river is simply a trickle. Behind it is this ugly urban industrial city. But once you cross the river, you're in this incredible vast landscape of short grass plains with wildebeest, zebra, giraffe, antelopes of all kinds, as well as livestock, cattle, sheep and goats all intermingling with a community of people who uphold this tradition of pastoralism. And these are the people we've gone to talk to. We spoke to women and men, young people, old people. We stayed up until midnight speaking to one of the elders who was there when the park was gazetted. And he said that his people gave up the park in the 1940s because they believed that it would be used for the benefit of all Kenyans. So it was a big shock to them to see that the park was actually going to be developed into this almost like a theme park with all these developments and destroy the natural integrity of the biodiversity and the ecosystems and all the processes, but also perhaps the most severe concern they had was that the park is to be fenced. And this movement of wildlife from the park into the dispersal area and back every year and sometimes even on a daily basis would be interrupted. Enoch went about his work with such vigor, he's probably had never filmed wildlife before, but he was very excited. And at five in the morning, I got a knock on my door with Enoch saying, come, let's go film the animals. I was, I was like, I'm not getting up at five in the morning. It's dark out there. It's pitch black. And he left without me. I didn't see him again until about 11 in the morning. He's tired, he's torn, his shoe has fallen apart because he didn't just go out to film the animals, he jumped out of the vehicle and went chasing after them to film them. And the footage he got was really amazing. In a very short time, we had enough footage and interviews to tell a very compelling story about the importance of the dispersal area to the National Park and why this place should not be fenced. The feature came out on television the following Sunday and Enoch only told me that he felt it was going to be a major feature.
In fact, it ran on the national news for 27 minutes. The impact was massive. People were calling into the station. They were sending thousands of messages on social media saying, please don't destroy the national park. What I discovered in the process of telling this story, which is so close to my heart because I've been fighting for the Nairobi Park for decades, I discovered that when you share these stories, the enthusiasm of these new players far exceeds anything you could possibly expect. Enoch's story has been so powerful that now thousands of young people are organizing their own webinars and discussion bodies. They're writing letters to the government saying, don't destroy the national park. I realize that uh, these stories are important for us to share. And when you do it, you never know how powerful they can become. Next, we travel to Bangkok, Thailand with photographer and National Geographic explorer Shin Arun Ruktachai. As a conservation photographer who mostly shoots marine stories, I am supposed to be swatting a swarm of mosquitoes on some remote islands right now, but here I am being stuck in Bangkok instead. When it all began, I would never expect that Thailand could really manage to contain the situation where the current total confirmed case is slightly over 3,000, with less than 60 mortalities from COVID-19. Although we are the first country that detected the first case outside of China and also the top travel destinations of tourists from Wuhan. Personally, as a Thai, I don't have that much confidence in our military government to properly handle the situation for many reasons. So it seems very likely that Bangkok, a crowded city of over 8 million people, would be facing a dire situation. Face masks were hoarded in a city turned into ghost town and then Bangkok went into lockdown. But as I went to spend a week to do a coverage in the slum, instead of witnessing a runaway outbreak in the impoverished community, I ended up covering the work of teenage boys from the slum who went out every day as volunteers to sanitize their neighborhood instead because there was no outbreak there. Great job, boys. So then after a lengthy negotiation, I managed to gain access into the newly built ward for treating an active COVID case at one hospital. And surprise, the patient just got discharged right before I arrived. And that was the last COVID case at that hospital since, which was very really lovely. Okay, so I shall embed myself with a team of mobile COVID testing unit instead, going around the city to test the most risky group and throughout the whole week, the team detected a whopping number of zero patients out of a few hundred people that got tested. Hmm, all right. And then our new confirmed case per day eventually reached zero just after a month after our lockdown, with a few new cases per day once in a while leading to the reopening of Bangkok where people try to regain their lives back toward normalcy. Although with some social distancing measures, obviously. At this time, we are still unsure how we avoided the worst of the outbreak, but it is likely to be from a series of fortunate events. It could be from our social cooperation to strictly wear face masks in public, where I would get very, very intense stare from unhappy aunties on the streets if I forgot my mask at home. Or it could be from the relatively early lockdown of our city, which got me stranded here in the first place instead of shooting my other project at sea. Or the tireless effort of our healthcare workers who have been actively tra tracking cases since the first patient from Wuhan was detected here in January. Or there might be some unknown factor involved, but it seems that somehow we managed to dodge a bullet there. Anyhow, with the road to recovery for us here is still long, especially with the socio-economic impact, which could be much more crippling and longer lasting than the direct effect from the virus itself. As many business went down, an unemployment rate obviously shot up. Some fortunate ones left the city before the lockdown to the countryside, which is much cheaper to live. But for the others, they ended up homeless on the street, relying on food and donation from the other citizens. And as the common phrase on the streets goes as, dying from the virus is still better than dying of hunger. Some of them turned to one of the world's oldest professions, despite the high risk of contracting the virus from their customers. The cost of living in Thailand is still much cheaper comparing to the States, but Bangkok is quite an expensive place to live for majority of the Thai, 
considering our average household income of less than one thousand US dollar per month, while the income disparity in this country is the top fourth in the world. Based on the current situation here, my coverage has massively shifted from what what I expect, and it is now leading toward the socio-economic impact from COVID nineteen to the people here instead, especially the overlooked groups. Since there is hardly any effective measures from our government to handle these growing problems in our society, so I am now working on the impacts to sex workers in collaboration with an NGO here that provides support to the people in that industry and the impact to the Thai fisheries industry, where I am personally interested in with my background. And I guess that is it. I'm looking forward to get some better photo to show you when my project is complete. Thank you. What you're listening to is a song commissioned by fund recipient Benjamin Evine. Benjamin runs a network of rural community radio stations in Gabon and has commissioned songs by local artists to educate his listeners about how to stay safe from the pandemic. Next, we head to Yerevan, Armenia, to photographer and National Geographic explorer Anush Babajanyan. Hello, I'm Anush Babajanyan, a photographer based in Yerevan, Armenia, and through a grant from the National Geographic Society, I was able to photograph the changing ways of education in Armenia. To document the transition, I've been photographing children and adults who experienced the changes to visualize what online learning or the lack of it looked like. Uh, and what the children are in up to during the hours that they would otherwise spend at school. For parents, there is an additional workload of having to film videos and take pictures of homework done by their children. And this is what I photographed in the village Haitach, where I met Mariam Abelian, who was um, photographing her two children uh, next to a monument in the middle of the village, reciting Victory Day poems in history. In the same village, I photographed Nushik Gasparian uh, looking into the smartphone that belonged to her grandmother and going through the homework that her mother photographed for her teachers. In another village called Taronik, I uh, photographed children helping their families with uh, activities that um, they wouldn't otherwise be up to because the morning hours would be spent at school. I was uh, also interested in seeing what children with disabilities were experiencing, what their challenges were. And for that, I spoke to Robert Grigorian's mother, who explained to me that the main challenge for him at this time was learning the sign language, which he needed to be in the presence of his teacher. I also spoke to um, a woman named Anna Kamai, who um, thought that online learning didn't really work for her daughter, and she preferred to spend this time learning life experiences and just um, uh, being separate from school activities for a while. Also, educators at work from home and empty schools are a great part of this story as well. Besides photographing children outside and also educators, I also really wanted to include a personal perspective in this story because I myself am a mother and my two children, my daughter who's eight years old and my son who's 10 years old are also experiencing this. 
And so we had to go through a lot of changes of me really helping them with homeschooling and really adjusting to this period when they had a lot of online meetings. And so we would often set up a camera on a tripod and just turn it on a mode that takes continuous pictures and go on with our activities. And that became a great part of the story just as well because I couldn't otherwise really uh, do intimate work in these circumstances when we cannot really go into people's homes. And so, for example, I photographed my daughter coming, going out into the backyard with her computer, with the dog running around during her online class, which is a little strange and could definitely be strange if looking through our former perspective. And the times has changed to, to uh, that extent. And so my personal ex uh, perspective really allowed me to understand what uh, people, um, what families are going through in these circumstances. And as difficult and as different as this time has been for so many of us, it has truly revealed a lot about who we are as teachers and as learners. Thank you. Next, we head to Caracas, Venezuela to hear from visual storyteller and National Geographic explorer, Andrea Hernandez. COVID-19 is like a ghost or a spirit. We can't see it. But hunger is a familiar face in Venezuela and we are more afraid of it than we are of the virus. For this story, I've been photographing the Redoma de Petare, the commercial area of the biggest low-income neighborhood in Latin America. The first time I went to this place, I felt like part of a fabric, a cell within many with the same purpose, to shop. I returned recently to make images for this story, and it was the same as always, vibrant with activity. The only difference was that everyone was wearing face masks with different patterns, colors, and textures because Petare is diverse, but with its face covered now. For us, quarantine is a luxury and social distancing is little more than a funny suggestion, a trend in New York, the subject of memes to be sent through poor signal via WhatsApp so that we can laugh and not cry. For most people in this neighborhood, staying at home wasn't an option at the beginning and it isn't an option now because if they stay in, they don't eat. The government has extended quarantine and people know that going out and shopping and selling things are high risk activities, but they would rather risk themselves than hear their children ask for more food because there's nothing more. While I was photographing a woman with a plastic bag with three plantains in one arm and a small boy with a Captain America mask on the other said to me, Mija, I don't know anything about the virus. I don't know anything about anything. The only thing that I do know is that we need to move forward, whatever it takes. And if she says it, I believe her. I heard courage in her voice. And I see it when I look at people climbing down the steep barrio stairs. I gravitate toward these stories like the ones at the Redoma de Petare. They are stories about resilience. And we need a reminder that we can be greater and better than we think. This is the value of our work. Hi, everybody. Um, I am so happy to welcome one of National Geographic's COVID fund recipients and explorers, Lynn Johnson. Um, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to talk to Lynn today and really hear about her work and how she's looking at COVID um, right now. She's, she's in the middle of a story and we're lucky to have her with us. So welcome, Lynn. Oh, hi, Caitlin. Uh, good to be here. Thank you. Yeah. So Lynn, you're coming to us from your home in Florida, correct? Actually, uh, Pittsburgh. In Pittsburgh. Okay. So. So Lynn's coming us, to us from, from Pittsburgh. We're in the same time zone now, but she's been working on a project still in the United States, but on the other coast. So Lynn, can you tell us a little bit about where you're working and, and why you chose to go there? Mm -hmm. 
So I'm actually working on an island called Whidbey Island. It's just off the coast of Seattle, Washington State. And um, I know that uh, we all are drawn to stories for different reasons. I sort of feel like this story chose me. Um, my birth sister, who I didn't grow up with but met 15 years ago, is actually part of the leadership team in a small critical care hospital out there. And um, it became clear that the stressors of working in that hospital, even though they have 21 beds, were extreme. And I could hear her voice degrading as, as the days went on and the weeks went on. And I thought, oh my God, everyone's looking at New York and New Orleans and um, of course, but perhaps there's another story here, a story that isn't being told. Yeah, and it's a story of, of rural America, right? Um, Ex exactly, um, basically because of uh, this COVID crisis, there are approximately a quarter of the rural healthcare facilities in this country that are at risk of closing. You know, they always work on a very small margin, but now, you know, millions and millions of people could actually lose access to healthcare. Um, they're being pushed over the edge, so. So Lynn, for those who aren't as familiar with your work, you've covered diseases, zoonotic diseases in the past. I, I think some of my favorite images that you've made that are seared in my brain are from your work on um, monkeypox mm -hmm. and SARS and Ebola. Why, you know, you, you decided to cover this current pandemic, not in a head-on science way necessarily. You're not in the lab. You're not looking at the, the, the drivers. You're going very human. Can you talk about why? Sure. I, th I think that um, even when I've done stories in the past that could have been science-driven, I mean, the information is always based in science. But why do we care about any given issue or trend or phenomenon um, unless we see the impact in people's lives? So the goal for me is always to humanize. And I think it's, it's tough to humanize data and statistics. You know, we were, we're, we're bombarded with um, these maps that show numbers, you know, like, changing by the day and and being uh you know they're so extreme we can't even imagine what that means so i think to bring it back down to everyday life in a small place and see the impact of this virus and the um the 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 hell and the chaos that it is creating in people's lives individual lives especially in surprising ways, is super important. What have some of those surprises been? Um, I think mostly it's uh, that you don't have to be COVID positive to be impacted by COVID. I mean, because the fear is, is, what, is what's driving so much of people's behavior today. And of course, it's a real thing. You know, people are suffering. You know, medical personnel are being extraordinarily brave, but they're brave in Whidbey Island too, even though there is no one necessarily that is positive. For instance, the EMS um, personnel, their, uh, their calls are up 25, 35, 45 percent, but they're not necessarily COVID calls, but they have to respond as if it is COVID. So a call that might have taken 15 minutes now takes two hours because of decontamination. And, you know, everyone is majorly stressed. They're using up PPE like crazy. They, they don't have enough to go around. Um, and also they're seeing calls that have to do with you know, domestic violence is up. Um, uh, sort of mental health issues 
are more are common now. So the stress is, is creating complications that may not have to do specifically, uh, you know, aren't viral related in that regard. And I can imagine that it's, it's, this story is the same across our country, right? But there are elements of it, aspects of it that are particularly rural that you're seeing. Right, and you talked about the, the healthcare being at risk in rural areas, but what else has struck you um, in, in the rural setting on Whidbey Island? You know, it's the space, too. You know, we have, we're, we're seeing a lot of um, urban settings, you know, buildings close together. That's, in fact, probably part of transmission intensity. Um, so in Whidbey Island, for instance, I really wanted to get on the rooftop of the hospital to see their little testing tent. You know, it's just like this minuscule, like it, maybe like a family of five would fit in that tent. And it's just as professional as, and perhaps more so, than um, the testing that's going on in some other locations. So, but you can see it's set in the, you know, there's like a cornfield and there's a, a a secondary highway that sort of goes off into the distance and you can see that they're surrounded by nature and um, and I think that's that's a symbol of something else um, that of um, you know how is your neighbor different and in that case the neighbor is someone you know and so they're testing their neighbors they're caring for their neighbors you know they're in fear for the lives of their neighbors. Yeah, there's no anonymity in a small town, is there? No, no, just complexity of, of a different nature. Right, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think that sometimes we try to uh, confuse simplicity and, 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 I, and reductiveness, right? And they're, they're not the same thing. It's complex yeah. in your own way. Right, right. Um, I, I'm hoping you can take us inside the hospital the first time you walked in. Had you been there before? Uh, no, I'd never been there before. Been. And, and really one of, the, one of the reasons I wanted to go was, you know, I felt like I needed to support my sister. I needed to mm -hmm. physically be there as a presence to say, yes, uh, you know, like I'm from the outside and, and the outside cares too about what's going on on this island, about the fact that you're losing $2 million a month, uh, the fact that you have no PPE and you're making it out of um, plastic that Home Depot is donating. So there was a whole team of people in the basement of the hospital. I'm sorry, I'm not answering your question, but anyway. Oh, this is good. <laughs> um, in the basement of the hospital. And they were literally, they had this plastic out on tables and they were cutting out the shape you know of a person and then uh you know heat sealing it and that was the ppe that was being used in the beginning wow and you you know you cannot remove that object without contaminating yourself so it was you know it's like talk about brave and and what an absurd absurd thought right Yes, yes, totally absurd. And I think they were using that same uh, approach in other locations, but, but at least in those locations, in those massive urban uh, facilities, they knew that help was coming. On an island, one of the first things a woman said to me was, you know, when you live on an island, you know the chances are not good that someone is coming to your rescue. Hmm. So they have to do it themselves. They had to figure it out themselves. And I felt like, you know, my sis was one of the people doing that. And I, was, I just wanted to, yeah. I mean, it's always personal, right? We're professionals, oh. but it's always personal as well. Yeah. So you, so you go there. Did mm -hmm. your sister take you into the hospital? Did she tour you through? <laughs> Um, so I go there and I actually entered with her and it was almost like going into your old grade school or something. You know, it was like very old fashioned. Uh, it, they're in the old part of the hospital 
and um, the 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 uh, administrative offices, and um, you know carpet and these sort of like they've turned hospital rooms into offices. You know they're using a whiteboard to keep the to keep track of all the stats, um, and it's just very. You know, it's just like on the surface, it's very low tech. Mm. The, the, the um, you know, the management team is about eight people. Their head of nursing is 35 years old, 35. It's like, it's a new team. They, they have some maturity in the team. They have some great expertise, but they've just recently all come together. And this is, um, you know, kind of a baptism of fire, so... That was, you, you stole the words from me. That's where that was the image that, that came to my mind, baptism by fire. And so mm -hmm. you, you obviously developed relationships with the people in the hospital, but how about the patients? What were the patients like? Who's there? So there aren't a lot of people there because people are afraid to come to the hospital unless they're desperate. And that's a part of the, part of the problem. And because there are no operations, I mean, you can walk down the halls and even though, um, you know, in the other part of the building, which is fairly modern, um, when you go into the ICU and you go into recovery and you go into pre-op, uh, it looks like any, you know, small hospital, uh, sliding doors, all the same kind of, but there is like, no one there. Wow. And this is why they're $2 million in the hole for, you know, every month. And I'm, I'm sure it's more than that by now because they've, you know, dispensed with all, um, all surgeries that are not based in trauma. <clears throat> so um, those empty spaces I found to be quite haunting. Yeah. And um, so meeting the patients, uh, the, two of the patients that I met, jet older gentlemen who were actually COVID po positive, um, were, you know, part of that at-risk group, a little bit older. The one was, hmm, was dealing with a little bit of dementia, but um, you could tell that the nurse who was caring for him refused to be distant. You know, she understood that you still have to touch people. You still have to um, give care. You know, she shaved him. She, you know, give him, gave him a, a bath. And I think you could see him kind of relaxing into the comfort of that after being in the hospital for weeks, probably like eight weeks. Wow. Um, the other gentleman, uh, was quite slender. He had been, he had survived nine days on a ventilator, which was, is, is pretty extraordinary. A lot of people on ventilators are just not surviving. So he was a tough dude. Yeah, it's, it seems like, you know, it's quite a juxtaposition. You've described these tender caregiving moments, mm -hmm. you know, healthcare workers are caregivers and, and yet the fear that they must feel putting on Home Depot plastic. Right. Um, how, how, how do you sense the mental toll that that's taking on them? It has to be. Well, I asked the nurses specifically how they dealt with going into those rooms and every last one of them said oh i pray i pray before i go into the room and um and i know that this person needs me and and i'm a professional mm -hmm. you know, I, this i'm a medical professional and this is what we do and so even though it's not the volume or the, you know, and they don't have that sort of like desperate um, body count, so to speak, of some of these massive urban center involvement. Um, you know, still every person, it's one life at a time. 
you know, you're dealing with one life at a time. And so you can see them focus and marshal their full complement of who they are, their medical expertise, their spirit, their emotional grounding, and then they go in. Yeah. And I guess time will tell, not just here, but everywhere, the long-term impacts and effects of that. Oh, yeah. Uh, definitely. Oh, they definitely have PTSD. Definitely. No question. Yeah. And I mean, you're now starting to see a lot of articles about uh, professionals needing support, um, and especially because of the numbers of folks. But in the case of Whidbey Island, uh, these folks, it's a critical care hospital. So by definition, a p patients in a critical care hospital have to be shipped out mm -hmm. to a larger facility after a certain number of hours. Maybe it's like three or four days. But in this case, they, they couldn't ship them out because the rest of the facilities around that were more you know urban in Seattle, for instance, and um, they, they couldn't take those patients. So they had to figure out how to deal with them. And they had to learn, so they had the extra pressure of learning new expertise, new technology. The 10 ventilators that they were sent um, by the federal government were then taken away again and wow. sent to New York. So what's the message? The message is, of course, that, well, you're not that important. You're way down on the food chain. We need those back, please. They're going to New York. How many ventilators do they have today? You know, I think they had a donation of about six others. So uh, they arrived just before I left. I'm not sure what the count is now. But they didn't want to use, I mean, they, they were new, brand new machines. So now they have to figure out how to use them. Can you turn this on? Yeah. Wow. Um, you didn't only just go to the hospital. You went to some clinics and you visited some um, home health, or you, you went along on some home health visits. Mm -hmm. What do you yes. want to share about that? Okay, so on the first visit, I was really just trying to, to, to sort of like understand the whole range of, of possibilities. Mm -hmm. I, I sort of knew that if I was going to have an opportunity to really tell this story, I had to know, you had to know, you know, back home where, where the decisions are made they, they they have to know you all have to know like what is the potential here is is there a story and what does it look like um so yes so i spent some time also in the or looking at um with the anesthesiologist who had to figure out whether this plexiglass protection device was going to work uh, i went to the clinics the the system has eight clinics <clears throat> and they all closed except one. So the entire, the staff of every other clinic was jammed into this one building. And you could see that the classic hierarchy and status conscious um, structure of medicine, talk about being flattened out, that got flattened out in a big way because you know, whether you're a medical tech or a fancy physician or a specialist or a secretary, you know, everybody was in one place. And so they started to problem solve in a different way. Um, they're seeing the sickest patients, of course, because people are waiting longer and longer and longer before they go to the doctors. And that's what happened with the home health care uh, as well. So people are actually waiting past the time when they can get help and, and past the time when help actually makes a difference in their life. And so many people are moving directly to hospice care. And uh, so the home health has seen a big, um, you know, seen the numbers of people who need them. Yeah growing pretty fast. And I can imagine that that story is being repeated and replayed all across this country and, and probably globally. Yeah, oh, I'm sure. You know, we've been hearing a lot about um, how 
medical professionals are there trying to connect there in the room as a person is passing, trying to connect via cell phone or some like completely horrible way, you know, insufficient way um, to loved ones who are outside, um, outside that room or in a different part of the world. And um, so really it's, it's the presence, the physical presence and the energy of that home health worker or of that medical professional that is like the critical link uh, for the person who, are, who is in the last stages of life. And uh, I feel completely honored to have been in the presence of primarily women who were doing this work. And um, each and every one of them uh, it, you can tell that their commitment is, is quite strong, even though they have the burden of the PPE. And, you know, they, they're, they're doing that work for a reason, because they want, to, they want to help people at that time. But the PPE and all the restrictions are actually a barrier to their identity and their mission. And it's exhausting for them. I can imagine. Mm. Well, and we only have a few minutes left. I want to talk to you for hours. Fascinating what you've been able to see. Um, I, I don't think you know this, but I use a quote from you all the time. Mm. All the time. Um, when you speak about the power of images, I love the concept that you put in my brain about images layered in a consciousness. Mm. And, and, and I think you said it, an individual, a national, an international consciousness give power and, and, can, and can drive towards change. Mm. Okay. And I, I just so love that quote and, and that fact. I think it drives a lot of what we do at National Geographic. And so I guess I would just end with you by asking, you know, you're, you're at the beginning of this story. It's not really an assignment. It feels like a calling. It feels like familiar, familial duty almost. Yes. At the beginning of this, what, is, what are the images that you want to layer? What, what's the impact you want? Can you see it clearly or are you still in discovery mode? Hmm. I would say always in discovery mode. So that's sort of here. And you know, it's like these different vibrational kind of layers. But one of the greatest things is that, you know, even though I'm using my journalistic you know, standards, way of working, there's something amazing about doing this uh, with a grant that I feel like I can think differently, see differently. You know, it's like there's, there's the... Um, Hmm, I'm not sure I can articulate this at this point, but there is this sort of uh, that the belief in the work is driving the work and the belief in that these images can be utilized not just by the society, but by a broader, you know, they have a broader purpose. I can, can we now create this permeable line between journalist and activist and advocate? Is this an opportunity to kind of celebrate and experiment with that? You know, we're not, we sort of, as journalists, it's like a whole nother conversation. Yeah, we could have a lot. You know, we're supposed to do something. We're supposed to do this. But like, I've been doing this for 40 years. I want to do this now. You know, we need to think differently in these times. Absolutely. I am grateful for the opportunity to do this, really. I don't, I don't know how powerful it can be. I think it will be. I, and, and Lynn, I, I just want to thank you for sharing with us. And I know that whatever this ends up being, it's, it's going to be incredible. It is incredible. And, and I just want to, again, thank you for your, your openness and your graciousness in sharing a, a story in progress. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to do so.
Lastly, we travel back to Nairobi to photojournalist and documentary photographer Brian Otieno. Hello, my name is Brian Otieno and I'm a photographer based here in Nairobi, Kenya. I was born and raised in Kibera, which is the largest slum settlement in Africa and home to between 350,000 to a million people, depending on whom you ask. Uh, Kibera is largely known from news, documentaries, and even movies. But most of these stories are always told in a similar way, from the perspective of poverty, violence, and disease. Growing up in Kibera, I witnessed that side of life. But life in my community is much more than this. While walking through the dark corners of the neighborhood, I also witnessed courage, resilience, ambition, and togetherness. One afternoon in September of 2013, when come, after coming back from my classes, I sat on a boulder rock near the rail line that passes through Kibera and searched for the images of my neighborhood on Google. The images that I saw became the foundation story of my project, Kibera Stories, which documents the unknown and the unseen stories of my neighborhood. COVID-19 hit Kenya in March 2020 while I was on assignment in Uganda. The cases kept rising and that forced me to return to Kenya just one day before the borders were closed. And a few days later, a curfew and a partial lockdown were introduced. I applied for the National Geographic Emergency Fund because I wanted to go back to Kibera and spend time documenting how the community was dealing with this new reality. Most of the people in Kibera are casual laborers, surviving on daily wages, which they mostly spend on food. If they're not able to leave the slum to go look for work, then they're not able to feed their children or even pay rent. Asha Jaffa is a freelance journalist and also a social activist who started the initiative called Kibra Food Drive to fundraise for food and support the families who are affected by the lockdown and the curfew. And together with a team of volunteers, she has helped 1,700 families who received donations of food items such as flour, sugar, rice, and cooking oil, which is enough to feed them for at least two weeks. Moses Somondi is a well-known community leader, and he started the project called Adapter Family. This project connects well-off families or financially stable people with the poor living in the slum. Also with this team of volunteers, they identify people living with chronic illness, the elderly, and those who cannot fend for themselves. And they connect them with well-off individuals who send them $15 every week that they can use to, to buy basic needs. The project has so far connected 350 families. Joachim Kwaru expresses himself through art. He has been educating the community through murals with information now to prevent the spread of coronavirus. He believes that art can bring change. If a child sees a graffiti of a person wearing a mask, he will feel encouraged and start to wear one too. And as the number of confirmed coronavirus cases continue to rise in Kenya, Kibera has been affected in different ways. And in the last month, there has been a water shortage in the community. And while water being a vital resource in the fight against coronavirus, the settlement has been left at risk. With these stories, I hope that they will raise awareness about the impact of the pandemic on the lives of people living in urban informal settlements who normally live with very limited resources and poor access to water, safe housing, and adequate food supply. The situation became even more drastic with COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you to the six journalists who've joined us today. Thank you to all for tuning in. And as I said earlier, these storytellers are representative. They represent a cohort that is working in many countries around the world as we speak. I wanna thank those who have contributed to expanding our fund. 
These financial contributions mean that we are able to put more money into the hands of more storytellers. Thank you to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Department of Science Education, the Rita Allen Foundation, Dane Nichols, and Robin and Lisa Lott Bentz. If any of you have any questions as to how you can get involved with the fund, with our journalists, with our storytelling efforts, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you to our production team for making this event possible. Liz, Eddie, Shane, Jen, Justin, you've edited, produced, and enabled us to do live TV from my living room. And as I sign off, I'd like to leave you with a collection of images from our other fund recipients. I hope these stories and these images move you in the way they have moved me. <laughs>